for the first half of this talk, I will hand it off to uh, Hector Martin, uh, the project founder and lead of Asahi Linux, and we'll get to learn something about the current state of Asahi Linux. And then here we're going to learn something new about how firmware works, how we handle Apple's firmware in Asahi Linux. So um, a warm welcome for Hector, who joins from Tokyo. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so I hope uh, this works fine. I am sorry for not being able to be there um, in person. Uh, I'm still recovering from a weird like cold or something that's been going on for uh, three weeks now. And I didn't think getting on a you know 14 hour flight sounded like a good idea, but um, hopefully we can do this remotely and we won't have any trouble thanks to uh, the magic of technology. So, all right, uh, let's get started. So um, the talk is from Asahi Linux to Ubuntu running Linux on Apple Silicon. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, who we are first. Um, so I am Hector Martin. Um, I go by Marcan online most of the time. I am the Asahi Linux founder and project lead, and Tobias Heider, um, Toby, is the Ubuntu Asahi project lead. Um, so I will start off by uh, talking a bit, little bit about Asahi Linux. Um, so you've probably heard of us if you are at this talk. Um, but quoting from our website, um, Asahi Linux aims to bring you a polished Linux experience on Apple Silicon Max. And what that means is we are doing um, as much as we can end to end to make Linux and in particular desktop Linux work well on Apple's new machines. Uh, so that means not just you know drivers and things like that, but just making everything uh, sort of work together as it should. And a lot of people get confused and think that Asahi Linux is a distro. Um, we are not a distro. We do is we work with distros. Um, so uh, our goal is to get everything upstream and working and to collaborate with distros so that we can offer different types of um, Linux, different flavors of Linux on Apple Silicon. Um, all of our work, um, at least on like the core side, is 100% volunteer or um, do donation funded. So there's no help from Apple. Um, but there's also no hate from Apple. And, and that's very important. Uh, so Apple Silicon devices are embedded ARM64 devices. And that means we are using device trees for configuration. There is no ACP. Um, the boot system is completely custom, at least on Apple's side. Um, the peripherals are basically all custom Apple stuff. And if you look at the platform overall, it's a lot closer to a Raspberry Pi than a PC, except, you know, like actually fast. And our goal is to make this work at least as well as Linux on x86, if not better, and do all that upstreaming everything. So if you look at the embedded Linux world, it's kind of a mess of, uh, most of the time, it's a mess of outdated downstream vendor kernels. Um, the bootloader ecosystems are fragmented. The distros tend to be vendor, you know, custom distros. There isn't really much user choice on any given system. Um, and, you know, like standard distros may or may not work to some extent, but it's kind of sketchy. Um, those vendor distros often have outdated or non-standard libraries. There is very little focus on upstreaming, at least from the vendor side. And, uh, and those vendors also rarely contribute across the whole stack. So you see a lot of fragmentation um, in the ecosystem. And, you know, when I started the project, I thought we can do way better than that. So our flagship distro port um, is the Fedora Asahi Remix which has been in beta since August. Uh, the release is going to be really soon now. Um, I'm pretty sure it's going to be this month. And the goal is that it should work just as well as Fedora on AMD64, and definitely much better than like Fedora on a Raspberry Pi. Not to hate on you know, all the wonderful people that are working on that, um, but like our standard is basically the bar we want to meet is x86. We want to be as good as x86 support and AMD64 support. And that has to work all out of the box and mostly upstream. So, you know, relying as little as possible on forks and things like that. So to talk about that, um, here's how the upstreaming state is for the Fedora Asahi Remix. All of our bespoke packages are packaged upstream in Fedora repos. You can install them on any other um, uh, Fedora system, even x86 systems. They won't do much there, but you can. Um, and all the fixes and improvements to existing user land are basically upstream in the respective um, projects. What we have downstream is the kernel. We have a kernel fork, which is in the process of being upstreamed, and that's one of the hardest parts. We also have Rust for Linux support in particular, which the default Fedora kernel does not. Um, we have Mesa with um, support for our GPUs. That is actually like a 90% upstream, except the UABI for sort of process reasons. We have U-Boot downstream. That's also basically all upstream already, except for the some boot config details. 
and our branding and image creation and uh, Calamari's config repos and stuff like that. So just, you know, basically branding details that go into the final images we make are downstream. But all the core components, all the platform support, everything except the kernel, Mesa, and U-Boot is already Fedora upstream. And so as I said in that slide, a polished Linux experience, what does that mean? Sure, we have to write the kernel drivers and Mesa drivers, and that's a lot of work. But we also have to deal with bootloaders, and we have to deal with the install and update tooling, and we have to deal with boot and vendor firmware tooling, and we have to deal with user space system tooling, and we have to deal with platform support demons, because we're going to have to write some stuff to make things work. We also have a lot of integration around audio to deal with, and also desktop environments. There's always going to be things that don't work out of the box for various reasons. So all of this is thing, are things we have to work on, because a lot of people think we are working just on like the kernel drivers, and then everything else just works. Uh, not really. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's a lot of work outside the kernel and outside, you know, like the Mesa drivers, and there's a lot of bug fixing. Um, actually, yeah. So, so there's a lot of bug fixing. We'll talk about that in a second. But when you are kind of this first platform that is ARM64 desktop Linux that people actually want to like use as a daily driver system, because most of the time people, you know. There wasn't really any viable platform that had the like spec requirements and the experience that people wanted on ARM64. And Raspberry Pi is not a great dev workstation, nor are most Chrome OS um, laptops, unless you're just using it as a remote um, terminal. So yeah, we find a lot of bugs everywhere. So things that we have um, as part of our uh, Fedora Remix and then the you know core repos. Um, this is sort of one of our biggest things right now. We have the uh, fully OpenGL ES 3.1 conformant driver for Apple GPUs. It's conformant on all the uh, variants, on all the chips that Apple sells until the M3, obviously, that just got announced right now. Um, but up until the M2 and all the variants of that, it is certified conformant OpenGL ES 3.1 on all of them. And that is the world's first driver to have any um, Chronos conformance for Apple, uh, because macOS does not have that. They, they do not actually pass the tests. <laughs> Uh, of like any of the OpenGL version tests. Um, and we have desktop OpenGL 3.1, soon 3.3. Um, that's not conformant because honestly nobody does like 100% conformance for desktop OpenGL is kind of, is kind of pointless because that includes the like legacy OpenGL 1 stuff that, you know, some cat software from the 90s uses and nobody else cares about. Um, but ES conformance is very, you know, is the big thing because ES is like the subset of OpenGL that matters. And if ES works, then pretty much everything people care about about desktop OpenGL is also going to work. Um, so that's a big deal. But it's not just the GPU driver because everyone knows about the GPU driver. We also have to do things like get the speakers to sound properly because um, did you know that most recent speakers need DSP to not sound terrible? And um, as far as I know, we are going to be not, this isn't released yet, but it's going to be very soon. We're going to be the first desktop Linux platform with out of the box software DSP for the speakers. And that means I and um, James, who is also working on this, have been sitting around and sticking microphones in top of, uh, in front of laptops and calibrating the frequency response so that we can go from something that looks like that to something that looks like that. And that makes a huge difference. And as far as I know, this has never been done on Linux before. It's part of the reason why speakers on laptops tend to sound worse on Linux on some devices than on the like vendor drivers on Windows. And um, and you know, this has been a thing on other platforms for a long time. It's it's a thing on cell phones. It's you know, it's it, you have to use DSP, right? But we haven't had this integrated in Linux. Of course, you could DIY, you know, some plug-in DSP, but this has to work out of the box and just look like regular speakers, including the crossovers, because the, sometimes these laptops have up to six speakers, uh, and you have to split the signal and do all kinds of processing. And we also have like a um, fake bass uh, plugin that we wrote. It's called Bank Sound. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into that. And not only the DSP, we also have, as far as I know, the world's first um, open smart amp implementation. And what that is, is that basically the, when you send, when you say you have a speaker um, that is plugged into a 10 watt amplifier and you give it full scale music, you're probably only going to be sending that speaker a max of like two, three watts, if that. Uh, so the, the worst case power is a lot um, higher than the case, you know, the power you send to a speaker when you're playing normal music. And that's especially the case for the tweeters when you have uh, two-way systems. And so that means is that if you're limiting the volume of the amplifier to a volume that is safe to 
um, have the speakers that for any input signal, then you are wasting a lot of headroom there. And so every micro speaker system uh, on like tablets and phones everywhere is using some kind of smart amp system where you actually um, estimate the temperature of the speaker voice kill and magnet based on feedback from the amplifiers. And then you limit your volume, your gain based on that. If the speaker gets too hot, you lower the volume. But if it doesn't get too hot, you can send peaks to it that are way higher than its maximum power. And this is also one of those things that is just, it's obvious. It's everyone does it on at least tablets and phones. Most um, laptop manufacturers do not care about this kind of stuff, which is why most laptops have terrible audio, but Macs don't. And we want to sound at least as good as Mac OS. So we have to do all of this. And on Macs, it's done in software. So we have to do it in software. And that's how Speaker Safety D came around. Um, and then there's things like this, like the touch bar, right? The, the, there's exactly two models of MacBooks, and there will be no more, hopefully, that have this thing and are Apple Silicon. That's an OLED um, MIPI DSi screen hooked up to a custom display controller and a Broadcom touchscreen hooked up via SPI to a custom SPI controller with a custom SPI HID um, over SPI protocol that is different than the um, HID over SPI protocol that the keyboard uses, because of course it is. So all that has to work. And since the kernel just sees a, you know, a frame buffer and a input device, once we have the drivers in, we need something to drive that. And so we have a daemon for that that you know puts out the keys and uses u input to um send input events to the rest of the system and it all just works and you know it it integrates with the actual keys on the keyboard you press function the, the little labels change you can send the special keys all that these are all the things that we have to do to make this actually function properly right it's not just about getting the drivers in there's a lot of work that goes into all the integration so the machines work as you expect them and then, of course, there's the installer. So we have an installer. It's text-based, but it's very user-friendly. Uh, we don't actually have any docs for it. You just say, run it, and nobody has complaints. So I think we did a good job. Uh, and it just guides you through the system, you know, through um, all the process that goes into installing, which I will um, talk about more in a second. But that's another component that we have to deal with. And then, is, as I said, there are bugs. Um, there's lots of kernel bugs. Um, we found out that ARM64 Atomics were broken for over two years in mainline Linux. Oops. Um, turns out that those bugs reproduce a lot more uh, easily when your CPU is highly out of order and um, you know very high end like Apple CPUs are and don't really reproduce on little tiny ARM cores. Uh, we found framework bugs. The Qt5 JS JIT started crashing at some point in ARM64 and tracked that down. We fixed desktop bugs like, you know, KWIN, Compositor, glitches and performance issues. We've even found compiler bugs. I found a GCC bug that was miscompiling executables that turned out to be over two years old and also affecting all architectures just differently. Um, here's a fun new one. Uh, so we just enabled the webcam. And the newer um, Apple laptops are probably the only laptops in existence that do vertical video, as in the sensor physically is square and you can crop out horizontal or vertical video. And it turns out a lot of uh, video for Linux apps cannot handle that because, first of all, a lot of them will default to vertical video because the algorithm for picking a resolution is whatever is tallest, which kind of breaks with that. But also, um, Vertical resolutions, which become horizontal in vertical video, tend to be non-powers of two or non-close, you know, to a multiple to a large power of two, which means we end up needing uh, stride padding. V4L2 supports that, but a lot of apps don't, and so then they break. And uh, lots of apps are broken on page sizes that are greater than 4K because ARM64 supports 16K and 64K. And it turns out a lot of apps make assumptions about that, some of them large, some of them small. Um, I, there was one where Chromium was had broken with RTC, depending on how many network interfaces you had, because they were using Netlink on a buffer that was 4K, and Netlink messages from the kernel can be up to one page in size. That's that's what the stuff we run into sometimes. And so the story here is if we run into a bug somewhere that is in any way related to the platform, we have to fix it. Um, we either get upstream to fix it or we track it down ourselves and fix it. But um, you know, we we take uh, responsibility for um, at least any core software that we are shipping and any implications of the platform. And there's a lot more. There's the U-boot port. There's the, you have scripts for extracting firmware and handling that. We have automatic bootloader and device tree updates. We have the Alice AUC and configurations to make the audio stuff work with Pipewire. Um, and by the way, for the speaker DSP, we worked with Pipewire and Wire Plumber to add a bunch of features we needed to make that work and out of the box and have like, um, you know, 
we just got a feature merged in to hide the physical speaker device. So we can just have our DSP, you know, fake output, virtual output, but then it's not marked as virtual. So KDE doesn't think it should display it. And and then the real one is hidden. So, you know, from the point of view of the system, you have a stereo, you know, speaker device that you set as your default output device and it works, but behind the scenes, all this DSP um, happens. So that's that was part of the speaker story there. That I forgot to mention. Um, I also made a white vine installer because it turns out that a lot of people want to watch Netflix or you know play Spotify, and um, Google doesn't make white vine available for ARM64 uh, Linux desktops, but they do for ARM64 Chrome OS desktops. And unfortunately, Chrome OS uses um, a weird glibc and a weird ABI, and so you can get it to work on um, standard ARM64. So we did. With some weirdness and some horribleness, um, but now we we have an installer that can just get it to work without any modifications to the rest of the system, and also things like our Calamaris first time setup is um, running on Wayland, and I think we're probably the first to do that because I had to send a bunch of patches for that, um, and uh, and that actually made our distribution, our remix, our Fedora remix, 100% Xorg free. We do not install Xorg the um, the you know the bare metal Xorg server anymore. Um, that you know everything on the system relies on Wayland. And we also have world-class dev and reverse engineering tooling, which is very important to get everyone working on this to have a good time and actually enjoy doing it. Um, I've kind of heard that even Apple uses some of our tools because they're better than theirs. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, they, you know, that's something that we worked a lot on, especially early on, because it's what makes all of this possible at all, right? Um, you need the tools to actually you know get to the point where you can um, work at a pace where we can uh, keep up with what apple is doing and so there's a lot of the uh, work that uh, went into that so that's what we're doing today and that's for things that are coming up my next sort of personal project is ci because we have a lot of platforms to support and different chips and different firmware versions we'll talk about that and so we're going to need continuous integration on real hardware to make that all work and so what you see there is the beginnings of the um, Asahi Linux CI cluster. And it's, uh, it's not plugged in yet, uh, but that's, that's where it's going to be. And that is another thing that we are setting up. So um, before I, had, uh, I hand over to uh, Tobias, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, a part of the platform that isn't very well understood, um, because I think that a lot of people that come into you know, the Apple Silicon ecosystem, they get very confused about how it all boots and how it all integrates with macOS and you know, whether this is a hack or this is something that is officially supported or how it works. Um, so let me just spend a few minutes talking a bit about how the platform boots. And the first thing you're gonna have to do is forget about everything you know about EFI or BIOS or, um, or anything like that. This is completely bespoke Apple stuff. So forget everything you think you know about how machines boot and, and check this out. So this is how a Mac OS, um, like an Apple Silicon machine with two Mac OS installs boots. So there's a boot ROM, of course, and then there's a NOR flash, just like on any um, x86 system. That's where the, you know, the, the BIOS would live. On Apple Silicon, that has a thing called iBoot 1 and system firmware. And so iBoot 1 is the first stage bootloader after the um, ROM, and its job is to boot an OS on the system, to um, select an OS to boot and boot it. And system firmware uh, refers to all the firmware on the system that is updated and system global. So that firmware is always a single version for the whole system. And then this is the clever part. What Apple does is that they use, um, they take advantage of APFS, which is their file system, which is kind of like ButterFS, uh, and so they have a single container by default on the disk um, for all the Mac OS installs you might have. And so that is an APFS partition or a container. Uh, the partitions are regular um, like TPT partitions. And so then that inside contains a preboot volume and a, um, actually the, the pair recovery OS is a little bit drawn wrong there. That's a, actually a, um, a single volume for all the um, installs. But there's a preboot volume, and then there are system and data volumes for, um, <clears throat> sorry, every Mac OS install. Let me get a drink a bit. Um, so my throat's going to dry. So we have um, separate root and you know data file systems for every Mac OS install, but there is a preboot. Um, volume that is shared and in different folders. What that contains is 
iBoot 2, which is the second stage bootloader, and that is in charge of loading the OS firmware and the XNU kernel. And the OS firmware refers to all the firmware that is attached to a given OS installed in the machine. And this is really clever because it allows Apple to break the ABI of that OS firmware on every Mac OS update if they feel like it. And since it's not global, but it's installed separately for every OS, um, they can do that and they won't break backwards compatibility because it's just a different copy. And uh, so that's how they do that. And, and then, you know, that uh, iBoot 2 loads the firmware, boots the kernel, then that just, you know, mounts the file systems and, and that's how Mac OS works. Um, and then you can also see there is a paired recovery OS. Um, I won't go into details about that right now, but um, each OS has a copy of its own recovery OS. And there is a system recovery OS that has everything an OS has and the recovery OS, but no, you know, no Mac OS. Um, and so that is used for recovery purposes, but it's also used as the boot picker. So when you switch OSs, all the graphical stuff on the screen is actually a stripped down Mac OS. It's not part of the firmware. Or if you think about it that way, recovery OS is part of the firmware however you want to see it. So how do we put Linux on these things? <laughs> and, and that's a typo there, on these things. Um, so Apple makes certain promises, um, and you it's not like they have a list of these promises, but you can infer these promises from the published documentation, the tools they provide, and, and sort of how the system is designed. And so these are the promises. Um, Apple promises that you can install multiple versions of macOS, that old versions will continue to work, at least on machines that they support at the time of their release. And they promise that you can replace the XNU kernel with any binary of your choice. And they promise that the system firmware ABA is stable and backwards compatible. But the spec is do whatever macOS does. Sorry. And, um, and you can have fun. That's, that's the story. So with that, here's how we install Asahi Linux. A Fedora Asahi install looks like this on the SSD. Uh, what we do is we have a macOS stub. So we have a fake macOS that has um, a copy of iBoot 2 and the OS firmware. But instead of the XNU kernel, we install a bootloader that we call Mini Stage 1. And then there's a paired recovery OS that is actually there. But the system and data partitions are basically empty. So they have to be there, but the, there is no root file system. So this isn't really macOS, but it looks like macOS. And then we create a separate EFI system partition. And that contains our mini stage two, which is our second stage bootloader. And that will load some embedded device trees and a copy of U-Boot. That then provides an EFI environment that allows the grub core to load in the normal way from the EFI system partition. And then that loads your kernel from slash boot and, and you know, the rest is just Linux, same as any other system. Uh, and so the interesting thing here is, thing here is that we have a Mac OS installed alongside every Linux install minus the root file system. So the way the installer works is that we resize Mac OS to make space, we resize the container. We are not sharing the APFS container with other Mac OS installs by design because we don't have to. And this makes it easier to uninstall and make sure we don't break anything. Um, so we make the we have to we have to repurchase anyway, so it doesn't matter. We resize macOS to make space. We create a um, container for the fake macOS, which is 2.5 gigabytes, which is not that bad, and all the volumes in there. And then we install macOS. Um, the Asahi installer is secretly a macOS installer. Um, it just pulls the components from Apple's um, server. They have zip files on there that contain all the bits and pieces for a restore, and you know the URLs are static and well known and uh, never change as far as anyone can tell and haven't for forever, basically, because they've been doing this for iOS for ages. Um, and so you can download bits and pieces of that and install them exactly the same way a regular macOS install works. Then we create the EFI system partition. Then we install mini stage two and the device trees and U-boot and all that into the ESP. Then you install the rest of the distro. And finally, we install mini as a replacement XNU kernel into the stub. And that's it. And then you can just boot Linux. And so then what about the ABI story? Uh, so as I said, system firmware has a stable ABI because it has to be backwards compatible with old macOS versions, but the OS firmware ABI is unstable. So what do we do about that? And the answer is that we picked specific supported ABI versions. So right now we support the macOS 12.3 on M1 machines and 12.4 on M2 machines and 13.5 on all machines, um, ABIs. And we only ever install those versions. So if you install any other version as your stub, that's not going to work. And 
the rule is that the kernel, the Linux kernel, cannot drop support for old ABI. So any ABI we bless as officially supported has to be supported by the kernel forever. Uh, but as far as iBoot and Apple are concerned, that means that we are just an old macOS install. We can just keep using those ABIs forever, and as long as macOS, that version, keeps booting, which it's supposed to, then we can keep booting, and the platform design guarantees that. Um, it does mean that the kernel needs to grow and you know ever-increasing support from, for different ABIs, but because we only had ABIs generally for device support and we try to space it out, um, and we have, you know, we've designed tools to, if, you know, make this maintainable on the kernel, and we are just about to have CI so we can test all these ABIs. That's not an, an unsurmountable um, task. It's a bit painful, but it's okay. So platform design guarantees this is stable, except, um, yeah, we kind of just had a little problem with the latest macOS release. Um, Apple broke the system from where ABI. That was a bug. Um, this broke macOS users. You'll find tons of um, macOS users saying they, you know, their machines became unbootable and they needed to be recovered with like a USB flashing thing, um, which is supported, by the way. You can't break a Mac, but you do need another Mac to fix it. So it's kind of not great. Um, Asahi installs were actually less affected by this because our drivers are more robust than Apple's, but it was still not great for the reasons that you couldn't actually recover your system because all the recovery stuff was also broken. Um, and this only affected some machines with certain obscure settings, which is why they didn't catch it. This was totally a bug. They Apple know about it. It is absolutely getting fixed. I have gotten confirmation of that. So, you know, some people were thinking, oh, you know, this is Apple not caring about Asahi. They broke their users. This is a bug, right? We we rely on this because they rely on this. And, you know, they, they screwed up and and they're fixing it and and that's it. So this was um, this was unfortunate, but it's you know the fact that it's getting fixed in the next version is is proof that that you know it's not supposed to have happened, and that we can continue to rely on um, on these um, on these rules on these promises. So uh, that's that's about it for my side. I am handing off to uh, Tobias. I hope uh, that was interesting. Well, I did learn something. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about uh, my own uh, side project that I started about a year ago, and I have never publicly talked about it. It's been around the internet. Uh, so you might have heard about it, and it's called Ubuntu Asahi. Um, much, like, um, much like the Upstream Asahi project, this is a community project our goal is pretty obvious. We take Ubuntu, we take Asahi, put them together and have the polished Ubuntu experience on Apple Silicon, right? Um, we, I think it's important to stress that we are a community. We are a, an open community. We, um, as long as you follow our social standards, we do have a code of conduct, which is the one from the Asahi project. Um, we also implicitly follow the Ubuntu code of conduct if you want to contribute upstream, of course. Um, and our ideas are pretty aligned with the Asahi project and Ubuntu projects overall. So we try to upstream everything and we don't hate other distros. No, we like to collaborate. It's important for us. Everyone has preferences. I think if we are working together, we get a better Linux ecosystem in the end. Um, so let me see if that works. Right, so first of all, I want to talk about how this all started. Um, that was too far. Yes. Um, like many of you in the audience, I got this pretty nice laptop, solid hardware, works very well, but it just so happens that for my work, I want to use Ubuntu. Um, other Linuxes, sure, that's better than nothing. But I just have like my single, you know, I, I don't want to remember 10 different ways of doing things. I just want to use Ubuntu, right? When I started looking into this, this was August uh, last year, there wasn't an option to run Ubuntu. But I found on the Asahi Wiki that there's a list of supported alternative software um, uh, Linux distributions. And one of them was PopOS. Um, PopOS, which was done by a person called Lucy, and uh, I have to thank her for that because it was brilliant. I um, I could start from there, 
change a few things, um, like the actual repository. That was pretty much a Ubuntu setup. Um, so with a little tweaks here and there, I got Ubuntu running on my laptop, and it was great, like it just worked. And uh, reading those scripts, I also understood what's needed to to provide to build an image that's that works with the Asahi installer. The props also to the Asahi project. Uh, the installer uh, is well suited for putting in other payloads. Uh, there's a lot of configurable parameters, so you can build your own distribution there. And back then, this was was kind of hacky, right? Um, we we didn't have any proper packages. We we didn't do things the right way. It was a debootstrap, and you put a kernel in, install the initial, um, install the initial bootloaders, etc. It worked. It was great. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk about what we've done since, to for you to learn what goes into porting your distribution, maybe. Um, if you look at the development history, that's from GitHub of our uh, Ubuntu Asahi repo, you, you first notice maybe that it's moved from my personal namespace to the Ubuntu Asahi organization because, well, I started it, but it's much bigger than me today. And the other thing you see is that it just doesn't look like there's much happening there. And, and if anything, we delete stuff. Like, what's that about? Um, but in reality, if you use it, you see it, it works by better today than it did at the start. And let's look at what we've done, right? So the first big thing we've done is we did stuff the right way. Instead of having a image build setup script that does things, maybe how Ubuntu is supposed to do them, maybe not, but it worked. We moved our logic to packages, and um, if you've ever done DAP packages, you know there's a way you can package things in DAPs, and there's a right way to package things in DAPs, and that's actually a, uh, a quite <laughs> time-consuming task. Um, so yeah, I think we've uh, we've seen a lot of those um, packages in in Hector's uh, part of the talk. Like you see, what what do we have in there? It's currently eleven around 11, I'm not quite sure, it packages. Um, we maintain them for two releases. Usually, currently, that's Chemi and Mantic, so we don't care about the um, about Kinetic, no Luna, the last one, uh, because that would just be a bit much to test. Um, overall, bootloaders, kernel, uh, firmware, also configs, um, Mesa is a big one, and one that's pretty Ubuntu specific here, Live CD root of us, which you use to build images in Launchpad uh, in the proper Ubuntu workflow. And we've got a meta package as well that just pulls in all of those. So, as you could uh, guess, I guess, our installer script got a lot shorter because now it only installs the meta package, pulls in all the rest, and that does the logic. Um, another effort we've been uh, driving is. Well, we started from Pop OS, and it was great that we could just reuse their tools. And another distribution that was looking into uh, better Apple Silicon support is Debian. And uh, so we thought, well, why not just make our packages available the proper way so that every Debian-based or Ubuntu-based, which is implicitly kind of the same thing, right, uh, distribution can reuse those packages. We do the work anyway and others might be able to help us, might be able to tell us how to do it better. So um, I'm very actively working closely with the Debian Bananas uh, community, which is the Debian team that tries to uh, do the same thing we do, I guess. Um, and it's it's working great. I'm getting great feedback there and learning a lot about, a lot about doing it the right way instead of just doing. Um, and this is, I think, I think Mark said Debian is remarkable because it just works and uh, we're doing our part. We're giving back and I think that's great. Um, and big thanks to the Debian developers who help us even though they don't use Ubuntu. But yeah, that's the kind of collaboration I'm talking about. Um, next big thing, embracing Launchpad. You might have heard of Launchpad. You might think of Launchpad as the place you host your PPA set maybe even a Git repository host. But let me tell you, it does a lot more than that. 
Um, and I, I don't even pretend to know like 10% of what it does. But I found um, while I was working on this that looking closely into how Ubuntu, like proper Ubuntu images are built, there's a lot to discover. Um, so um, we use Launchpad to, to build our binary packages via PPAs. We uh, serve those packages via Launchpad. We host our Git repositories on Launchpad and GitHub. Um, but one cool thing Launchpad can do is it can build packages on Git pushes. That's nice. Now it can also rebase those onto the newest version, like onto the newest archive version. So you can maintain your diff and it rebases it continuously on, on the newest archive version, which takes away a huge part of you know manual rebasing work. Great. Um, and the other thing it does is it, it builds system images for Ubuntu using live CD rootfs. So you can just hand off a, a huge part of the process of actually building the image. That's what we previously did with like dbootstrap and custom scripts straight to launch bed. And uh, you get a lot of options for free because it, it also implements a bit more than our initial scripts did. More about that later. Another thing we worked on, we got help from the Ubuntu desktop team here, is Snap support. So initially, when I ran Ubuntu the first time, I, I think Snaps didn't work at all. There was a bug in, um, in Snapcraft. Well, it was not actually Snapcraft. Snapcraft was calling Patch Elf. Patch Elf aligned Elf sections by 4K. Doesn't work on a 16K kernel. Snap binaries wouldn't run. That was quickly resolved by the Snapcraft team. And, uh, and that's how we, we encountered a lot of those ecosystem bugs at the start. Looks a lot better now, um, thanks to Asahi and, and others using it as well. Another great example of collaboration, right? The ecosystem is getting better. Another big thing in uh, Snaps is graphics acceleration. Um, the way it currently works is we have a kernel driver. Um, the API is not stable though, so you always need a matching Mesa version. So we, we usually update Mesa and kernel um, in tandem, you can imagine not great for snaps, right? If you package your Mesa into a snap, uh, it's going to be outdated at a point. That's kind of part of the concept. So what we did is, uh, thanks to um, actually uh, another group of people working on support for the X13S, who I think came up with that solution, and the desktop team, we now have a dedicated GNOME snap which bundles our Mesa version. That is on a separate Snap channel on Ubuntu Asahi updates. We subscribe to that channel and we keep that up to date with our current kernel. Even on Chami, we, we have like what you would call a hardware enablement kernel. We always use the newest. So it kind of works on Chami and Mantic. You get the right Mesa, Snaps work, even with graphics acceleration, which is great because we want to have a great out of the box experience and we don't have we don't want to have a custom setup, right? Firefox is a snap by default. Now it just works. Awesome. Um, and that brings us to our plans for the future. Um, I, I said launchpad. If if you use launchpad to build images, it gives you a few more options. One of the big ones is well, flavors are also built that way, and uh, we've discovered that the way we currently build our images. Building flavors is actually only one option away. Like, we pass it in as an argument, and you can get Kubuntu, um, you can get whatever. It's worth noting, as Hector said, Wayland works better. <laughs> um, but I, I would really appreciate if we could get flavor installers. Um, I think it would be great. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to use uh, Kubuntu. I know people who do use Cinnamon. Um, and if you if you are working with any flavors and you meet me, I, I'd like to talk about that. Um, another thing uh, we currently don't have is a proper USB installer. Um, it doesn't support USB booting out of the box. Um, so, well, we've heard before, it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi, right? We, we build our image, we flash it onto disk, and then 
well, there's a lot of choices that are made before that step usually, right? So you get my uh, pre-selected defaults, and those might not be what you want. It got, doesn't give you the full choice of a proper Ubuntu installer. You're like, you might want to use ZFS, you might want to use full disk encryption, and currently, if you want to have that, it's uh, kind of tricky to set up. I do have to go the full Gentoo way, basically. Um, so solving that problem, maybe using desktop provisioning, maybe using other solutions, that would be great. So that's that's on the roadmap. Uh, bottom left, what's that? That's a number um, <laughs> for the next Ubuntu release, LTS release, it's going to be called Noble Numbered. Um, and one of our big goals is having the central components in the archive, having proper support. Maybe it doesn't have to be great. Of course, it would be better if it was. But having a bootable system in the Ubuntu archive without, without requiring a PPA, which we currently use, I think that's I think that's actually doable together with our work on Debian, quite realistic. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And then the last one, um, <clears throat> I um, didn't didn't really know about that before I came here. But on the first day, we saw a great presentation on Ubuntu Core desktop, um, and I think that would be a cool thing to have on your uh, Apple laptop, right? So a immutable Ubuntu distribution. Um, it sounds pretty doable. I've seen a Raspberry Pi running it, so why not? And with that, <clears throat> give me a bit of time to scan the QR code. <laughs> hmm. But not quite yet. There's a few more things I have to say. Um, so. The QR code leads you to a website, which compiles all the information we have for you, how to install it, uh, communication channels, et cetera, et cetera, documentation. Um, that's your central point of information, I guess. And then there's another thing I want to mention, which is uh, Mastodon. <clears throat> we have a very active Mastodon account managed by Mark Esler here. Um, and it's, well, we're trying to boost everything um, kind of Asahi related. So I think it's a great news feed. If you're interested in the general subject, follow that one. You will learn everything that happens in the world of Asahi and Ubuntu. And uh, down here, that's how you install it. Um, we host our installer script on ubuntuasahi.org. On macOS, you pipe it into your shell and it should install. If you want to read it, of course, pipe it into a file, read it first. That's the fast way. Um, and now, finally, I want to say thank you to the people who made this possible, because it wasn't just us. It was uh, the Asahi project who built all this awesome upstream software, the kernel forks. This, I mean, that's really smart stuff. I, I'm not sure if I could do that. Um, the Ubuntu project, which helped us do so many things, like the desktop team, the kernel team is helping us, um, the Debian project, for helping us with the packages and everyone in the wider community as well. Like there's people, we've got people replying on GitHub to random issues, people helping in the chat. Um, and I think that's amazing. That's, that's great. And finally, the Asahi project is run by volunteers who uh, work on their own time, but they do accept donations. If you want to support us, please support the Asahi team. This QR code should take you to the website, asahilinux.org slash support. Tells you how to donate to the Asahi Upstream developers. And uh, we would all really appreciate if you did that. Um, and we've got a bit of time left though. So um, what I haven't told you yet is um, I did all this uh, setup here um, while Mark was talking. So this presentation is actually running on a M1 Mini here on my desk. Um, and uh, I guess it's time for a little demo. Uh, I told you snaps are working. Uh, that's a snap. <laughs> um, who, does anyone know Sonotic? I hope you do. Um, it's great. It's kind of like a Quake clone. 
and we'll just uh, see if it works. Um, so this is the Rust uh, kernel driver produced by the Asahi project. You might have read about it in the news. Um, and there we go. Um, that's accelerated. It just works. Um, All right, and then I guess we do have time for questions or you'll have to watch me die. <laughs> raise your hand, then I'll chase you down. Hi, I <clears throat> suppose this is a question maybe tomorrow uh, to, to Hector, not sure if he's still there. Yeah. Um, so you said that we you have to kind of bless the um, OS firmware version for uh, the different, um, whenever you decide and you need to. Do you think, like, what do you think may be the risk uh, if you, you know, skip a firmware version or like what would cause you to decide that the newer, a new firmware really needs to get blessed and, you know, go from there? So basically, we just go by platform support. Um, Apple releases new Macs, and they only support from that macOS release onwards. So, for example, we bless 13.5 because it's the first official version to support all the previous platforms released this year until M3. Uh, and so, it's a bit of a um, you know game of chess, deciding whether you're going to support a new release like the M3 that just got released right now. Um, with the version that they came from. We did that for the M2 with 0.4. I think that was a mistake. We should have waited for, waited for 12.5 because we could have unified that with the M1 support. Um, but for example, in this case for M3, we are probably going to wait until they release an M3 Mac Mini, which we're hoping probably happen early next year, um, because that will allow us to run that version in CI, uh, which is basically Mac Minis. Um, and so there's, there's a bit of a game there, right? Where it's like, okay, we're gonna support the U platform, very quickly, but then add more firmware versions or wait a little bit and then, um, you know, bless a given version when it, you know, merges like, you know, two different lines of machines and the same one. So it's just a, it's just a decision game around that. It's not so much a risk um, in terms of what version we pick for some technical reason. It's just reducing the proliferation of supported versions so we don't need this to add workload to us. Well, um, let me ask it this way. H how fun is it working with the extra fancy chips like the neural engine, the other accelerators? Uh, so any experience or guidance there? Um, so we don't actually have support for um, almost any of the accelerators. And well, we actually get this question a lot. It's like people saying, well, if you don't do video acceleration, uh, like how is that usable? So people have tested that these machines last longer on battery doing software decoding of video than most Intel's doing hardware decoding. Um, so it turns out it doesn't really matter for, you know, the, for usability, but yes, we will support most of those accelerators. We don't yet though. Um, so we have the GPU, we have, um, that's as far as accelerators, you know, actual compute, that's pretty much it. Um, Aileen reverse engineered the neural engine and actually has driver. We just haven't merged it yet because um, it hasn't been a priority because there's no, so that there's no standard like OpenGL and OpenCL for um, machine learning. So either way you need, you know, like to port ecosystem packages. So it's not like we could just plug in and, and make like TensorFlow work um, using it. Um, but we will merge it um, eventually. And um, she is now looking at the video decoder. So we are gonna support that as soon as that's ready. Um, uh, we have some demos of the ProRes decoders running. Um, we do a lot of demos in Python with our like dev framework. It's part of the process we have. So we have a demo for the ProRes. Um, I think we have a demo for JPEG, but I don't think anyone cares about JPEG acceleration anymore. Um, and the other big one that's gonna have to come eventually is the video encoder. Um, but yeah, right now we don't really have any of the extra stuff. It's not the CPU because you don't need it for a usable system. And so we're focusing on all the IO things that like, you know, like the speakers, which we haven't publicly released yet because a lot of people care about the, the speakers working then about, you know, video decoding being somewhat more efficient. Uh, hi, thank you for the amazing work first off. And my question would be, have anyone looked into supporting Apple's Secure Enclave under Linux for storing disk encryption keys possibly? 
Um, so we that's also on the list of things to come, right? Um, so I don't think we have much for the secure enclave yet, but that's definitely on the list. So once we, there's sort of a vague priority list, right? The way the, the project works is that if you want to come in and work on X, you can totally do that. And, you know, whatever people want to work on is the priority for them. And then I get to work on everything else, right? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that's getting mostly full-time funded by, by the donations. And so, you know, but I sort of encourage uh, people to work on the things that we care about the most. And I myself, you know, sort of, we will take things down that list. And so right now we're in the wrapping up like IO hardware support phase. The next big thing there is going to be DisplayPort, um, alternate mode and Thunderbolt. And once we move past that phase, then we're going to start branching out into the decoders and the, uh, and yes, the, the security stuff. So yes, the goal is in fact, to eventually be able to do things like have your SSH keys in the secure enclave and support Touch ID and all those fun things that macOS can do. And we'll probably be more flexible than macOS because we, and this is the theme in general, we're not bound by macOS APIs. Um, so we can make better use of the GPU than you can on macOS with layers on top of metal, for example. So we will have almost certainly better Vulkan support than with Molten BK on macOS. We have more low level interfaces for the neural engine, what Aileen um, figured out. So that will be more flexible than the core ML stuff on macOS. So that, that's kind of the theme here. Um, and m most likely we will have more, for example, I think we can do ED25519 on the SCP, even though there's no public API for that on macOS. So things like that would probably be pretty interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so to just summarize a little bit, uh, do you consider uh, Ubuntu Asahi to be a viable alternative to the macOS operating system at this point for uh, mere mortal, for simple users, not the geeks in this room. So can a normal people just use it as it is now? I'm pretty sure I know normal people who are using it today. It really depends on the feature set uh, you, you require for your daily work. So there's a few things that don't work yet. Uh, one of them is speaker support. It's not enabled yet as a security measure. Microphone doesn't work yet. And uh, external display support, those are the big ones I can think of. Um, it served me well for the last year pretty much as a work machine. So um, it's, it's certainly usable. I know other people who are not developers who use it and are super happy about it. Um, I think ultimately you'd have to try it. Um, the the setup is very non-destructive, so you always get a dual boot environment. It's it's easy to remove. Um, that we are not aware of cases breaking your macOS installation or anything like that, or breaking your device. It's not generally a thing. Um, so um, I guess try it. I'd say yes. Okay, thank you. We get the question a lot, and and the, it really does boil down to like. Are the features you need in there yet or not, right? Um, for example, a lot of people have been using it as a remote headless system since way before our initial release, like a few months into the project, because that worked very early on. Um, and you know, the CPUs work and all that. Uh, but then, you know, if you if you do uh, video conferencing all day, every day, well, the webcam was just supported um, very recently. Speakers are coming with the Fedora Asahi release, hopefully microphones too. So like not today, but hopefully very soon. If you need external displays, then maybe wait a little bit more. If you need Thunderbolt, that might be a bit later. Um, it just depends on your personal use case. And to add to that, I have hardware here. So you can look at my M2 Air um, and see if it works. So um, I'll be outside. And whoever wants to have a look at the hardware running it, free to find me. I'll be trying it. Um, we're out of time, but the um, upcoming, we have an hour break, I think. We'll be back here at 4 o'clock, or if I have this correctly. No. Yes, half hour break. Thank you. We have a half hour break um, just to get tea, coffee, mingle for a bit. Um, at the hour, we will have in here uh, sustainability talk. <laughs>